And we're live. Hello and welcome to our virtual presentation of One in a Billion with author Nancy Pine and our moderator, Michelle Zack. Uh, we have signed book plates available for those who purchase a copy of One in a Billion tonight. Uh, just click on the green purchase button and write signed book plate in the order comments when you are checking out your cart. Also, this event includes an audience Q&A. To submit a question, please use the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen. You can also vote for any questions you'd like, and they will make their way to the top of the list. Also, Romans is the oldest independent bookstore in Southern California, so it's thanks to avid readers like yourselves uh, that keep our doors open. So any bit of support you can give our way goes a very long way. All right, so with that said, let me introduce our guests and then we can get started. So Nancy Pine holds a PhD in education and has, and has traveled and studied in rural China for decades. She is one of the leading American experts on Chinese early childhood education. She founded the Bridging Cultures US-China program and has advised the administration and faculty on China at Mount St. Mary's University in Los Angeles. Joining Nancy tonight is award-winning writer and journalist Michelle Zack. While working for Asia Week and Far Eastern Economic Review, she lived and worked in Thailand during the 1990s, where she wrote the first version of her book, The Lisu, Far From the Ruler. Okay, so with that said, I'm gonna turn off my camera and hand things over to Michelle. Enjoy the talk, everyone. Thank you, Rira. And <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Great to be here. Yes. And I would just like to say it's wonderful to be at Romans, which is our local bookstore. Yes. I've been going there since I was five years old, and <laughs> every every book I've written, I've always felt welcome there. Right. So I'm really right. happy to be here right. with, with Nancy. Yes, yes. Who, and likewise, and I've spent much too much money at Romans, I must say, <laughs> but it's a pleasure. <laughs> okay, well, let's just jump in. Nancy, I just loved your book. Uh, I recommended it to my book club. They all loved it and then mm -hmm. gone on to even buy some of your, your other books. Um, I thought we could start with just maybe give us a very brief intellectual history of what led you to writing this book um, and meet, you know, meeting on way and, and, and why did you why did you write this book? What, what's your intellectual right. story? That led you here? <laughs> I'll try to keep it short. <laughs> uh, so as a first grade uh, teacher in the Pasadena uh, Unified School District. I decided uh, to return to graduate school uh, mid-career and learn a lot more about how young children learn. And so um, that was a great adventure. I continued to teach. And after about two years in the graduate program, my advisor asked me and another graduate student if we would be interested in traveling with him to China. He collaborated with English professors at Nanjing University and helping them to upgrade their uh, university because, in fact, they had been closed for 10 years during the Cultural Revolution. Um, the two of us went, the two graduate, I and another, the other graduate student went. It was the end of 1989, a very tense time, but it was a very productive trip. Um, we spent the first week with our advisor, uh, teaching us the basics of how to do research there, of meeting tons of people, and uh, also um, just sort of learning our way around and feeling more at home. We met a lot of wonderful people. And then our advisor left and left us in the hands of, of his colleagues. And uh, we spent two very productive weeks uh, collecting preliminary data in the preschools. After two years, I did get a PhD and doing research in comparing Chinese and American young children in specific areas. And then I went on to do research and uh, consulting in China for the next many, many years. Uh, it was 10 years into that uh, that I met on Wei. But during those first 10 years, I actually ended up uh, meeting a couple of people whose story seemed appealing to me in the sense that it would help uh, Americans understand things better, uh, a more nuanced view of life in China, living through the ups and downs of its accomplishments and its disasters. And 
the first one was a colleague who was a researcher. She was 75 years old, feisty, uh, gotten plenty of trouble over the years. She was born before 1949, which was when the People's Republic of China began. And as a result, she, um, she, had, she, she just had lived through a lot. And her story would have been very valuable to tell to Americans. I met a couple of other people like that, but then I met Anway. So I'll stop there. Okay, well, I think what I loved about the book, one of the many things, was that it's a really good example of biography as history, looking at history through the lens oh, yes. of one yes. person. Yes. So tell us a little bit about Anway. Um, how did you meet him and, uh, and why did you zero in on him right. to, to write your book? Yes. Well, Anway is a hard-driving, stubborn man who grew up in a very poor village in the middle of China. Uh, and he was born, like these other people I had met before 1949. His first year of primary school was actually the first year of the People's Republic of China. And so his life went up and down uh, through, the, through the history of modern China. So he lived through all of its accomplishments and all of its awful disasters. And so that already sort of gave me a hint that this was a good, a good story to think about. But in fact, he was, we were introduced by a friend who knew that the two of us were actually uh, doing projects that were very similar, trying to connect Americans and Chinese citizens just in everyday ways to communicate with each other and we learn each other's sort of daily lives and what their hopes and dreams were and how they took care of their children and, and just everyday things. And uh, so we worked on that for a couple of years, but he, his wife also, and his, you know, our interactions, I began to realize that he not only had his regular job, but he also started a lot of projects he started a translators association, which is still going. And he's convinced a, uh, an American organization called Global Volunteers to go uh, to China and help, uh, help colleges and high schools teach oral English because most people had not heard a native speaker. One of those projects was in his village. And I had always, since I started going to China, wanted to go to the the rural areas because 75, 80 percent of the population is rural or was. And so in 2004, I joined one of those projects and it was, um, it was just, it was eye-opening. We taught rural, rural English teachers, but we also learned about the village and how hard they were working in, during this harvest season in the fall. And so I returned again in 2006 at a different time of the, of the year in the spring when they were waiting for the, um, they were waiting for the crop to, it was winter wheat to ripen. And so it was more relaxed and they actually had more time to visit and Anwe agreed to tell us his story about growing up in the village. And as a result, I had an opening uh, that I could ask him if, that was a possibility. I offered to do an article and he was very interested in that. And so that's how it all began, although it was more than an article. So the article turned into a book yes. which you worked on over several years, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, the first time I interviewed him, which was uh, for three days, he talked nonstop for those three days, three days. And <laughs> he wove together the history of China in his life and it was amazing. And by the end of that, I know it was more than an article. And Anwei himself has, um, you know, experienced as a peasant, he rose up to, I don't know whether he'd be considered an intellectual, maybe not in the very specific right. Chinese way that exactly. he learned English, he spoke English so well, he was about to go off um, on a scholarship to study in England. And then the Cultural Revolution happened and he was sent back to the village to be taught by peasants, yet he was a peasant himself. Right, exactly. So all of these contradictions that 
uh, you know, that he lived through right. is what right. really made the story come, yeah. come alive yeah. for yeah. me. Yes, yeah. So how did you get him to open up or you say he was a talker? Oh, well, he was a talker, <laughs> but he only wanted to talk about big pictures. So he, he would talk about policy, foreign policy, national policy, the structure of the Communist Party, the bureaucracies of um, history. I mean, there were things that I needed to know, actually. But in fact, I also wanted to know what they wore and what they ate and things like that, which didn't interest him in the slightest. So after a year or so of trying to figure out how to do this, I realized I had a collection of old National Geographics because I had vowed a couple of years before that to learn the history of uh, 20th century, the first half of 20th century China, which is really complex, as you probably know. And um, so, so I dug through those National Geographics from the 1920s and 30s, and I found plenty of photographs of villages. And so I took took photographs of those and took them with me when I interviewed him. And so I'd show him, uh, you know, someone working in the field and say, is this, is this the clothing you wore? And actually on that one, I actually struck it rich. And he said, absolutely, that's exactly what we wore. And uh, then I'd show him tools or animals and millstones. And he'd tell me about them um, and whether or not he began to actually compare what he had to the pictures. And in fact, when I showed him a plow, he said, well, it's not quite the same as what we had. The head of ours was larger, but in fact, he then got up and started stomping around the hotel room and <laughs> to show me how he had learned to plow and the fact that it's very hard to actually keep the head of the plow in the, in the soil at the right level uh, while following a moving animal. So, <laughs> So that actually, after that, he was he was into it. It's that more. kind of that granular um, level that you talk about daily life, which yeah. is so interesting right. to me because usually we don't get that picture of China. We read maybe about Mao Zedong or the political, right. the global. Right. Yeah, you know. I mean, and the fact that um, he was a translator and he translated for. For Jimmy Carter, right? And, or yeah, he was an interpreter. Yeah, for Jimmy Carter. Wow. Yeah, for many world leaders at a very young age, uh, because there were so few people who were actually um, fluent, because their education had been cut off by the Cultural Revolution. Also, he was a very hardworking student. And and even if a Chinese person is fluent, it doesn't mean necessarily that an American can understand them. I know from doing oh, that's right. from doing <laughs> yes. research in China right. that you would have to be introduced to someone <laughs> yes. and could be your interpreter and yes. you simply couldn't understand them because right. the accent, the having never heard a native speaker, that's right. They don't get the opportunity to practice and yeah. to hear what yeah. spoken English. Yeah. You know, they can read really well, mm -hmm. they can analyze the articles, right. but they spoken English right. is there's not right. that many people. So I think his expertise, how did he become so good at that? And did that, didn't that cause him some trouble? Like other, you know, colleagues got kind of jealous that he would get chosen, even though he was more junior to, oh, yes. <laughs> to take, to be able yeah. to uh, right. interpret for the right. big weeks. And he had actually, he, when he went to college, I mean, no one in his village had ever gone to junior high school, let alone college, but he, he had worked very, very hard throughout. I mean, he studied probably twice as hard as many of the students as I learned it from both him, but also from other students, including one of his teachers. And so he actually, when he went to college, he was entered into, and he didn't have a choice of where you're going, but he had made, he had studied English in high school um, in order to, as, because it gave him a better chance at that time to actually get accepted into a university. And he, um, he went to the Xi'an Language Institute, it was called then, and they were very, very hard driving, specific, I mean, it was a language institute. So they, they had this little broken piece of mirror that each person got a broken piece of mirror 
and they kept it in their pockets so that they could keep looking at their mouths to make sure that they were forming their mouths exactly like the chart on the wall. And so, <laughs> very, so they were taught very good pronunciation. And um, then as far as being jealous, yes, when he, when he was working, he, he ended up working for the Foreign Affairs Office of the, of the province of Shanxi, which is quite large, and its, its center is Xi'an, which is a historical center. And so he actually was the only one there who was able to interpret well enough for foreigners. And so he worked very hard because he had to prepare for them. He had to do all the protocol and the, the arranging. But he also, of course, got to meet all of these people. He interpreted for the, the first person he interpreted for in Xi'an was the foreign minister of, uh, of Britain. And he was 32 years old at that point. So, so that was yeah. it's caused great jealousy. Yes, that yes that's right. And, and I love like there's so every aspect of his story. Like at, at that time, you, you get a bit of a political story of what was going on in the world. That a lot of language students were wanted to learn Russian because oh, that's, that's yeah, China that's exactly and Russia it. were still there that's was right. more jobs. Mm -hmm. But then mm -hmm. wasn't he advised by someone? Oh, there's not as many people in English. You're not going to have that's as much right. competition. Yes, that's so, right. Go for go for English. Yes, I mean, he yeah. he'd been on. I don't know how far he'd gotten on the Russian track, or if he just was chosen. No, he ne he yeah. never he never he never did Russian because when it came to they sort of study foreign languages seriously about their second year of high school, and uh, his teacher, who was wonderful, who um, I've actually met, um, was advised him that the only way he had a chance because he was coming to the countryside and very few people from the countryside passed those exams. Mm -hmm. So in fact, he went, uh, he did study English because there are only about four or five high schools in the province, or that area of the province that taught English. The rest, all the rest taught Russian. So yeah, all these interesting accidents of, of history right. that, that helped shape his life. That's in, right. In terms of, you've already mentioned his personal traits, that he was really hardworking. Were, were there other things about him that allowed him to advance? I mean, it's extremely rare for someone who was a peasant to reach oh, that's um, right. where yes. he yeah. went in his right. career. Was it? No, I think he was always very responsible. He was a leader in college, which, of course, when the Cultural Revolution came along, was a real disadvantage. And he spent two years just trying not to be killed. But um, he, you know, I think a lot, there were just, he studied very, very hard and thoroughly. I mean, he would go back over things again and again so he knew, and then he would ask questions. Um, and when he could, <laughs> which is always true in, in Chinese education. But in fact, he just he just pursued it. He was also, of course, very stubborn. So he would keep at things forever and um, and sort of plow past the people who are jealous, et cetera. So it seems also one of his traits is that he was a survivor, because if you understand and you read the story of what he went through being sent back to the village and this is when people were being um oh. you know uh, they were being killed That's and they were absolutely being absolutely right made yes. to live yes. in pig pens yes and, exactly. i mean and the detail exactly. of the, yes. the, yeah and and that's one thing I think we, we should mention is how if you're not if you don't know too much about the history of China the fact that you put these helpful little uh, sort of boxes which will oh, um, yes. yeah like that's you have three voices in your book Anway mm -hmm. and yourself when mm -hmm. you come into the story and then also the third uh, voice is more just historical background in a nutshell which right. I found very very helpful good. yeah. That's that's always good to know, and other people have said that too. That it really has has been helpful because it doesn't slow down the narrative of his story. Yeah, and people, but it, but it's there if you need it. Right. So I mean, since China's really in a crackdown, I mean, you were there over decades, and you know, and I know myself from being the you know the difference in China between the nineties when I was there and twenty fourteen is a different world, and in fact now things have been. Um, there's been a crackdown. Do you ever 
worry or concern? Do you have much concern about Anwe's safety? Has he been able to read this book? Um, what what oh, can you say about that? Complicated. Uh, he still doesn't have a copy of it, but um, that's part of that has still COVID. <laughs> oh, well, there's many complicating factors. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> um, but he, I don't worry about him, although things have obviously tightened that down a lot. I mean, really a lot. Uh, right now, because it's the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party and, and the government has been cracking down for months, uh, against any kind of co communication uh, through WeChat or through emails or whatever uh, about anything except, you know, the most platitudes, I think is the word. So uh, those of us who know Anway have just basically stopped communicating except saying Happy New Year or something, and we'll just wait another month or so before we say anything, and it won't be much. Uh, but he is a survivor and many people his age, he's in the 70s, he's, uh, he's not in great health, but he's, he's working every day on a project, which has to do, which is a safe project because it has to do with Helen Snow, whom he met, I mean, who he worked for, for uh, worked on to re restore her reputation uh, for a long time, but she was someone who was honored uh, by the, Chinese government, at least by the older people in the Chinese government. So, so that's a safe thing. The other thing is people who lived through the Cultural Revolution know how to be quiet. Well, yeah, that's, he was a reformer though in his own village. Oh, that's, he, oh, that's right, yes. So yes. he seemed to speak truth to power right. on a local level right. in a way that also showed incredible right. personal courage. Yes. He went up against the local party. Oh, that's right, he did. But I think it wasn't it wasn't physically as dangerous when the when the national government sort of goes after people, especially now. It just seems complicated, and I am certainly not an expert at all on this part of, of what's going on in China now, except that I know that there are plenty of people who are not happy about it in China, and but they just know how to be quiet. And the history of China has gone up and down like this for centuries uh, or longer, I mean, for 2,000 years in some ways. Um, so, so part of that's something that's very hard for us in the West to understand. Uh, but in fact, it's not, it is a tense time. And I had the luxury of being there for going there for almost 30 years at a time when it was much more open. We know that the Edgar and Helen Snow part of the story I found oh, just yes. utterly fascinating because, you know, at most, many people of my age, even if you're not a China expert, you would have heard about Edgar Snow. Maybe just uh, tell them just a little yeah. bit about yeah. that. That is one of the subplots right. of the story. Yeah. yeah, it's a subplot and it really needs to be a book of its own. <laughs> but, but to weave it into this story was a real challenge to me. But um, he, he admired the Snows a lot. Uh, they had gone, they were in China, they were journalists basically, and, and just they went in the 1920s when there were many Westerners there. In fact, Westerners sort of owned Shanghai as far as I can tell. And so they did many things, but they ended up moving to Beijing and they were actually, they befriended the students. It was a time when the nationalist government was not doing very much um, that had to do with good government. And- This is Chiang Kai-shek's government. Yes, yes, that's correct. And he, they actually allowed Japan to take over the Northern part of China and create some a country called, or a section called Manchuko, which was run by the Japanese. And, the students were horrified, the students in Beijing. And so the Snows actually helped um, sort of, so they supported them. They hid them in their apartment, various things. But they also got to know that there was this, this group called the Communist Party that nobody seemed to know anything about. And so eventually Edgar Snow, with a young student who was a good interpreter, 
uh, went to the west of China, a da very dangerous trip, uh, and found where the Communist Party was in Yan'an. And they actually, he spent several months there interviewing on uh, one, one way. This is before the world That's knew right. about Mao. <laughs> That's right. And wrote the book about about Mao Zedong and the communists, and it became a bestseller around the world called Red Star Over China. And um, Helen Snow was very involved in that too, but she never got any credit. And of course, that's part of what An Wei was trying to do was to get her credit restored. And uh, she actually then went later and did a lot of interviewing of Mao Zedong at even a more dangerous time than and uh, Edgar had gone. And she was writing back to her husband, Edgar Snow, in order to give him information. And she took a lot of the pictures in that book. So, and wasn't that like during the long march or when it was during when Mao was, uh, they were yeah. at war during the Civil War? That's right. Yes, absolutely. So, it was at the end of the long book. march. It's a yeah. very famous book. Yeah, yeah. It was at the end of the long march um, when he, he went. And they, they had spent, ten, the Communist Party had spent 10 years in Yan'an. Uh, Mao did all of his writing there, and he was a very literary writer. And, um, and he, they developed theory, and they basically consolidated their power. And from there, they moved out and began the real fighting back. During that time, they were being bombed by the nationalists the whole time. And and Anwar he turned into be an incredible scholar when he was part of his time in the wilderness. He was sent to some way to some place as punishment, and, and it turns out that was where there was the main archive, right? Yes, of, that's right. Yes, so that part yes. of the story I, I really yeah. love. Well, yeah. speaking about writing, can you tell us a little bit? How did you move from being an academic writer? This is a narrative. <laughs> this book is a very quick, easy, fascinating read, and you right. hadn't done this kind of writing. Previously, no. Well, I've done a little bit, you know, I've sort of played with it, I think is the word. When I first started going to China, I wrote things because my family and friends said, what on earth are you doing there? And so I began to try to write some of that, but nothing sort of serious. Um, and so uh, I knew I had to do something serious <laughs> in order to write a narrative because that's what this needed to be. And so I started taking courses at the uh, UCLA Writing Project, and I took a lot of nonfiction writing courses, and then I took a couple of essay writing courses, and I also took uh, a course or two in novel writing, not because this is fiction, this is, hopefully this book is as accurate as possible. Um, and so, but, I wanted to, I needed to know how to develop a person's character to you know, to make it come alive. And uh, so so that was very helpful, but then I knew I also needed something else. So I got a fellowship to the Vermont Studio Workshop. They accepted 90% visual artists, weavers, painters, printmakers, <laughs> you name it, sculptors, and 90 and 10% writers. And it was a great environment for me because there was so much cross-fertilization among all of the different artists. And so I had plenty of discussions, as we all did, about how to create a project, how to develop it, how to bring it you know, to conclusion, which is not easy to figure out how to end something. And so, yeah, so true. Yes. So many books and novels start out great, yes. and then they lose you, and you, and That's the end right. kind of fizzles. Yeah, yeah. you really have done right. a, a very right. a great job yeah. on the whole. Right. So you study fictional techniques, and um, but our way does he jumps off the page as a real person. That's really great. That's great. That you get to and I him. interviewed him for ten years, so oh. I have, and I. I had them all transcribed. I then went through them and marked them for tonal change, voice tonal change, mm -hmm. all of those things, plus accuracy. And then I go back, I dig out questions there, and then I go back and ask them. So I had the luxury of 10 years of interviewing him. And he was willing to well, talk. Well, yeah, he was a willing He subject. was a real talker. I mean, so in terms of the other research besides interviewing him, 
Um, did you, you talk to other people who knew him or uh, other like his, his historians or other people who were expert in in like village reform, all the, the kinds right, of projects right. that Ongwe got yeah. um, involved in? I had, of course, I've been doing research for uh, since I had been going to China. Yeah. So I had always talked to and collaborated with uh, experts, and of course, most of them were in uh, in education. But they, a lot of them had friends who were historians. So I had a I had a chance from the beginning to actually have plenty of conversations, just sort of educating myself about various issues. And because I was interested in rural areas, because I grew up in the rural area, <laughs> uh, I was just very, I, that was sort of one of my sort of side interests. So and you were so I, just studying early childhood education. Of course, in over 30 years, you could develop a lot oh, that's of That's right, a lot of, a lot of stuff. So, and then I did interview some people who, um, who actually disagreed with Anway, and he was very careful. He had to arrange for me to see them, but he did it through someone else, so they didn't know he was doing. Huh. So, um, and you mean enemies, personal enemies? Well, they weren't, so. they weren't enemies. They weren't the ones who really jumped out of the, the pages of the book. But in fact, they were just people who thought he really didn't, you know, he did too much. I mean, you know, various, various he pushed things. really hard. Well, he did, yeah, he did. Yes, yeah, so that sort of offended people who thought he should go slower, et cetera, et cetera. So the other thing is that I spent probably 10 or 11 weeks total in the village. And so um, over several years, but that really gave me an enormous amount of knowledge. Living in the living, I often lived in uh, his brother's number, brother number five's house, and uh, had a room there. And so it was just, uh, it was that was gave me a lot of good detail. In the early part of the book, in which you really uh, write about his boyhood and and as a villager, that part. Um, I really enjoyed that because again, you don't normally. Oh, that's right. Get that's to, right. And that part reads almost like a novel, but it's a true story right. of yeah. a village and you know one boy who had these high aspirations and was quite different from his peers. Right. He stood yes. out yeah, like that's from right. babyhood. That's, yeah, I, yeah, that's absolutely <laughs> right. Yes, he did indeed. Yeah. So, um, so in terms of your difficulty of doing research in China and what was it did the fact that you were coming there to research one thing early childhood education did that kind of make it easier for you to research in other areas like were they uh, you know did that sort of give you um, entree or or, or that or the Chinese officials weren't watching you because I know when I was in China I was followed and, and watched oh, goodness oh, okay all right so yeah but you did that I was no no and I, you know, who knows, who knows why? Um, because of course we went six months, the first time we went, we were six months after the, uh, after Tiananmen Square, which is obviously a very, uh, very tense, difficult time. And in fact, there were certainly many Americans who thought we shouldn't have gone. But uh, we actually, I had, because I knew, we had been introduced to all of these colleagues who were the colleagues of our advisor. We had a real in because he was highly respected and um, at the university level. And so, and he was also loved by the graduate students there. So <laughs> we had we had a lot of in that way. And the way that you did need some entree into the schools. I mean, just like here, you don't walk into a school and say, I want to see what's going on. What's the word there for connection? Oh, Guanxi. 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 Yeah, that's yeah. everything. Yeah, exactly. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yes. So you owe a lot. <laughs> so um, so that's um, that just gave us, I never had a problem getting into a school. Uh, the only schools that I didn't see uh, were the very poor ones. And that was, of course, no one wanted to show them to me, but also they, the people I knew didn't know, didn't know anything about, they didn't know anyone there. So you, was it kind of like uh, 
Temkin Village, you would just go to show schools? Or oh, no, no, not at all. And in fact, I can tell you some of the schools that people write about a lot. And, you know, they've gone to China for two weeks. They've seen some really wonderful lessons. And as one of the graduate students said, oh, I went to one of those schools. We did the same lesson 20 times <laughs> for each foreigner who came in. So, so it was highly scripted because it's one thing I learned watching watching in primary classes a lot was that in fact performance is very important. If you are going to do something, you practice and practice until it's perfect. And so that uh, that actually was uh, <laughs> so some people have seen only these these actually performance schools you might call them. Now I was in in basically schools that were uh, had teachers or principals who were who were known by my colleagues or contacts in, in the universities or they their kids went to the schools and so they got you know they they were real they, schools they, yeah they were absolutely real schools I tried really hard not to see the very best that the course people buy for and uh, so I saw sort of the, the middle what you would call the middle class schools maybe um, it's, it's not quite the same comparison this year but it's that's approximately what it is did you see any schools with the well, well i saw some Lisi schools okay. right and and they do um they are very old-fashioned by are in a lot of repetition a lot of memorization mm -hmm. um but you know that's a completely it's not um, I mean, I was really interested in, you know, this one group right. and, yes. and the fact that they all learned Chinese and they went to school in Chinese. It was just beginning to happen that they were beginning to learn, you know, in, in their own language. In their okay. language. Okay. So that was, right. you know, and, and it wasn't the, my focus at all. Right. So not, yeah. not the same yeah. thing okay. at all. Um, so. I should just say for readers that it's the first part of the book is all about Ang Wei and reads kind of like a biography and then enter Nancy. Yeah. So there's three voices in this book. Right. Um, and can you explain just a little bit about how you worked that out? Because it, 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 it makes it very dynamic. It, yeah. I think it makes it a very good read. Right. right. Well, I mean, the, the part about Ang Wei was obvious. I tried various ways to structure the book. And in fact, it was, uh, I finally went back to a pure chronology. And uh, so obviously the first part came from history, from being in the village, from hearing a lot from on way, and also just digging as much as I could for, for all those details. But um, then I started going. And then, so I could begin to, I, you know, I started in 1989 before I met him, but of course I was learning a lot about the Chinese culture. So, uh, one of my mentors, and you have plenty of critiquers when you write a book usually, and so the one who was probably the most important one kept saying, you've got to get your story embedded in the narrative. And I kept trying to do that, and it didn't work because I kept losing what I wanted to say about my experiences that I felt sort of shone light on, on Anway's life. And so I finally just pulled it out. And, and created my own story. And of course, there was much more of that story, which as I went through many edits, so a lot of it got locked out um, or who knows what. You but know. you, with, there's no confusion for the reader, you know, no. you're reading about Anway right. and then, or and your, I think it's your right. italics when you're- Yeah, I'm in, I'm in italics. And then, and then yes. there is the little uh, nutshell history. Right. So there's three things going, right. going yeah. on. And the publisher was very helpful. I mean, we went back and forth about, you know, how to how to separate them so that they're clear but to be, weren't not intrusive. So. so I was going to ask kind of, I think we, we want to move into questions pretty soon, I think. Um, but what impact do you hope or do you expect that the book will have oh. on, on readers? Like the, we have a lot of perceptions and a lot of misperceptions about China and, you know, the, the difficulties of life there and like on way got married and then hardly ever was able to live with his wife um, right. for the first yeah. 10 years and two kids and got together and made yeah. a kid and then. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Yes. So what, 
what do you hope that readers will, will gain from, from your book? Well, the, the reason I started writing it, because I was I was motivated from the beginning of meeting these earlier people I thought about telling the story. I was motivated to actually tell a story for American, especially for an American audience, um, to just give them the nuances, the pieces of life that often don't come through. And then, of course, when I, in a lot of the writing about China, and then when I met An Wei, because he was from a rural area and, and grew up a farmer, a peasant, he, he just, you know, the whole story just came to life in a whole nother way because we so seldom hear the stories of people from the rural areas. And so I, I just hope that as people read it, and I have been told by a number of people that they felt that they had learned history uh, much better uh, from uh, by reading Anway's story because it sort of glued it together. In fact, I just had a, a conversation, someone actually in another book group, uh, he's Chinese American, grew up in, in Taiwan for a lot of the time, but whose older family members had lived in China. And she said, actually, reading Anway's stories had glued it together because she had all these little bits and pieces about um, about incidents and stories from his her relatives, but no total picture. So I, I hope it's achieving what I had started out to, to do, and that was to write it in a way that's really readable and also uh, leaves readers with a better sense of, of the complexity of China. I mean, it really is a highly complex place. And what we get in the news is very often just a slice of it. Uh, so I just hope it brings well, I think you really I think you succeed. And um, I don't know um, if we have some reader questions. Are we? Um, uh, yeah, we do have some questions, but I know that we have some photos uh, we wanted oh, to show oh, the I audience first. All right, let's, let's look through some of them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we forgot about those. I thought of them once and then. All right. So maybe we can share some photos and uh, Nancy can just speak I'll, over I'll them just, and then, yeah, and then, just, and then yeah, we yeah. Have a few, we'll have a few Thank minutes you. left for questions. Thank you very much. All right. So um, let me... So that's the first picture. Yes, that's the first one, yes. This is this is obviously not during Anway's early childhood. This was in 2004, my first trip to Anjan Village. This is the entrance road after a rainstorm. That's the stickiest mud you've ever wanted to be in. Um, so it just sort of gives you an idea of life in the village even in 2004. This is the center of Anjan Village. Um, it's about three times the size that runs along the, the road that goes through Anshan, the, the main road going through, and then it goes out to the next village. It's about a block and a city block and a half long. So, And that little vehicle, that little three-wheeled oh, yes, three vehicle, wheels. I remember those yes. from China. Those are like the, the, the new yes. horses. And That's they, right. They carry oh, they, everything no, they, in no. the, that's right. And they're also larger ones. They're trucks with three wheels, too. Yeah, they're very maneuverable. Okay, go ahead, Mary. Uh, this is actually, this is in uh, probably 2006 I took this picture uh, because the winter, the winter wheat is just about right. Uh, this is an area of the village where villagers lived in the caves that you can see until the 1980s. Not all of them, but a number of them uh, lived in those caves. Those are caves? Back those are caves back there. It looks like they've been the bricked, bricked over. Or well, they, have a, they often are dug way into the, into the Los Hills, which is, remain solid most of the time. But uh, then they, they, uh, they often put a front on it, ah. made of adobe type stuff, so, yes. Okay, and this is that first time I went when they were working day and night. Uh, this is sort of, especially the picture on the bottom right, uh, is the kind of work they were doing day and night, and then they would 
husk the corn, hang it to dry, and then plow the fields and plant the crop. And always pushing against the weather because they're afraid it would change. Okay, we'll just go right through them now. Yeah, this is Anway. Uh, top left is Anway and his wife on their wedding in 1969. Um, he had it was he had uh, his new job in the Foreign Affairs Office. He had one room, which was his office and his bedroom. And uh, I think this was an actually a public a public space, which wasn't very big either. And they have. The, the circles they have on are their mountains because everyone had mountains at that time and carried the little red book with, of mouse. Oh, books. the same, yes. the same as same. That's right. And then the, the other one is of Anway and his family, his wife and the two children in 1981. And these are, we spent, one of the things I did to find things out was I knew I had to go visit places that were important to his life, including Yan'an, where he had been for a number of years during the Cultural Revolution and in a re-education camp for part of it. So I was gonna go by myself and he said, oh, don't do that. He said, they're trying to, the university was trying to get him to come give a talk. So the university vice president actually said, if you two come and give six or seven lectures, then we'll loan you the, cup, the the university car and the driver, oh and you can go all around. So that was a magnificent thing. But the upper left-hand picture is just sort of typical of what happens when you do something in China. I mean, there are also banners across yeah. the walkways announcing our presence, etc. So that's on way and me standing in front of one of these things, of these uh, things. And the, the one on the right is on way uh, just being on way during an interview. It was, that's in a hotel and in my hotel room. But he just, by the time, 2016, he was very relaxed in the, in the interviews and just, I think, enjoyed telling me plenty of stories about how he outwitted various people. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's on way as an adult. Okay. That's it. So um, we have time for some questions. Yeah, we have some uh, questions in here. This is the most popular one. Um, have you been in recent contact with Anway? Um, uh, the answer is yes. The last time I, I was spent time with him was the end of 2016. Uh, he, he now is in his late 70s. He is uh, not in great health. And about 2016, uh, I turned over all of the projects I was doing for Mount St. Mary's University. I finally managed to get them all turned over to the university. In fact, they became part of the, the structure of the university, which was very satisfying. But I had been carrying those for a long time, uh, various collaborations and shared courses and various other things at a couple of universities. So I and I had decided I was going to do other things besides research, which is highly demanding and uh, it gets, gets to you after a while, I think is the word. It's, it's highly detailed and you have to be very disciplined about it. Uh, so, so that part of my life in China really moved away. But the other thing was that Anway was not in good health and it was a big deal every time I went to Xi'an. He sort of, he always, he would hand me a, um, a schedule when I arrived that says, this is when we're going to do interviews. This is when you can take a walk. <laughs> this is when you're going to give a lecture to a university you didn't know you were giving a lecture to. This is when we're having dinner with so and so and so and so, and this is a banquet. So he actually, uh, there was just a lot of preparation that went on, and I also was staying the last with him, his wife, and they then had a condominium which was had some extra rooms in it, and so I would stay there. And we were still sort of, we weren't we weren't friend friends. We were sort of, we had a a distance in our relationship because I was the interviewer. Uh, but uh, so 
So those are the last things. We've, we've emailed back and forth a lot until the last year. And I have always sent him pieces of the book and said, you know, it's going to change. The writing's going to change, which of course it does continuously. But please check for facts. So he's done fact checking throughout the writing of the book for, for many years. And uh, very helpfully. And just filling in small gaps here and there. But he's never, he's never changed my voice or what I, you know, the judgments I have made. And you may not agree with all of them. But um, it is, it is my, my writing and my book. And I've tried to be as accurate as I possibly can. But I do have an opinion and I carry it with me. So, so that's probably as much. I do look forward to um, being back in touch with him after things go sort of after the government backs off son from Do the hundred the celebrate year celebrations calm down perhaps or? well I don't know it was it was it was just the other day so in fact um well just you know I think Westerners who knew China at all basically stopped communicating a couple of months ago and uh, so I've just been enormously careful and I you know it's because I've written this book, uh, I don't want to, I'm probably especially careful because I don't want, but there's stuff in it which, uh, if it, it was going to be translated, and in fact, um, a Beijing, uh, tra uh, a Beijing interpreting and translating organization has, has done all the paperwork for having it done. But I don't think it will be published now. I'd be very surprised if it were published because, I mean, there's a lot about the Cultural Revolution. There's a lot about his survival. There's a lot about the fact that he started a, a democratic village, a democratic congress in his village uh, against all of these, Michelle said, against all of the, the officials' desires, et cetera. So, um, so we know each other exists, and actually, uh, someone who's in the book, Sharon Crane, has often written him in, in more than I have, and basically told him what I was doing, and that I was doing presentations, et cetera. So um, hopefully, things will loosen up enough to communicate better. Yeah, fingers crossed, definitely. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I think we have time for one more question. Uh, can you talk about how he and other Chinese parents raised their children to learn truths that are against the government propaganda during communist rule? And this question is from Lisa. Uh, okay, could you, could you read it again? Yeah, I can read it again. So. Can you talk about how he and other Chinese parents raise their children to learn truths that are against the government propaganda during communist rule? I can talk about um, about on way, and I think you know it's very complicated because uh, because there's a lot more going on in China than just what we hear, and some of it's some of it's positive, and of course, some of it isn't. Uh, but I think for his own children, uh, they raised them to be just independent thinkers, I think is the best way to say it. Um, that they wanted them to think for themselves. Um, and, you know, that comes through in small ways. You don't have to say, you know, this isn't true or that isn't true. But, um, they, it just has, um, it has, you do things on a daily basis with kids. There's a message that gets through that's, that's subtle. And I think just the idea of, of thinking for yourself, which, and not following everything everyone says. And his children were pretty independent thinkers. And, um, and he, he also never pushed them to be, uh, nor did his wife, push them to be at the top of their class. I mean, many parents are pushing their kids to get, 
you know, here so they can get to the best university, so they can get a, a good job because such, there's so much competition. Um, as far as my friends, um, in some ways, I don't know that as much. I, I watch the, them just struggling with, with all the issues of a modernizing country. Um, one who, whose kid actually, whose kid actually ended up being sent to the United States to, for high school because they knew he would never survive in a Chinese school because he was too independent. And he really didn't care about going to the best college. He was interested. He set up a science lab, basically, in his bedroom. Uh, he did a lot of things. He asked questions in class, which was not what you usually did. I mean, they were, they were regular questions in a math class or something, but that's a, that was pretty unusual. So even that, even to ask a math or a science oh, yes, question. Yes. I imagine the parents really want their kids to learn the survival. That's uh, exactly you know, right. So that's they exactly have to, right. it must be quite a It's a real balance. And I've certainly had a lot of conversations with parents uh, about creativity and how on earth you, uh, you get to be creative when you've had to memorize textbooks for 18 years, which is what they have to do. Um, and the, the government has actually introduced some things that, that at least have loosened up education in a way. So it's not all absolutely. It's not all this rote yeah. anymore. Yeah. But in fact, um, it's still obviously very controlled. <laughs> it's such a high hurdle society i mean it was the irony is it was before and there was this revolution and yet it's still a very oh, high level, right. so hierarchical in terms of you but, know where you are in the party yeah, structure yes so oh yes that's right and of course i guess the party now has about 20 to 25 percent of the population is is a party member one thing that it may give you a little clue, and this isn't, I know this doesn't answer how the parents are teaching their kids, but there's just a lot that goes on in China that we don't hear about. For instance, whenever I was at a, at a table of five or six people for a dinner or for a banquet, part of the conversation every time was, what VPN are you using now? Because <laughs> a VPN is how you get over the firewall of China. And of course, the government is trying harder and harder and harder to, to cut that out. But I know very well that they haven't. They haven't. What is a VPN? Is a way to get around the. It's, it's a way what to is... get outside. Uh, technically, I can't tell you. Probably some people listening <laughs> could tell you. Uh, but it's a, it's a way. It's a way to actually uh, go access websites that are beyond your right because area. when i was in china i wasn't a vpn expert i couldn't get to facebook i couldn't get to the new york times i no. couldn't get to any western right. news out right. yeah another another really it sounds silly but it was an example that just opened my eyes early on in the first few years i was going to china i met some graduate students who had gone together to uh to to buy a computer and they had figured out how to hook it up through the plumbing pipes in their dormitory in order to get access to the websites that were that would teach them english which were outside of china i mean so so, so you just don't know some of the things uh, that's going on there are a lot of yes. resources inner yes, resources that's right. And there are, uh, there's a great book that was published a couple of years ago called Blockchain Chicken Farms and Other Stories of the Internet in Rural China. And there's some stories in there that are unbelievable um, as far as what people are doing that are just not sort of typical of what you would expect going on in China at this point. So I don't know whether that's helpful at all. But, uh, Okay.
All right. I think that about wraps it up. Uh, thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you so much, Michelle. And thank you to everyone who tuned in tonight. Again, we do have signed book plates available. Uh, you can get those by clicking on the green purchase link directly below the viewer screen. It'll take you to our website where you can complete your purchase. Uh, just make sure to write signed book plate in the order comments when you're checking out your cart. And also for those who tuned in late, don't worry, a replay of this talk will be available after the broadcast ends. And I think that about does it. Uh, thank you, everyone, again, and have a good night. All right. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone, everyone for joining yes. us. Thank you very, very much. Right. Good night. <laughs>